Kyle Sondland and Herbert Konings are founding partners for Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Security Token Show. We're coming to you from our studio in sunny Miami, Florida. I'm your host, Herwin Konings, and I'm joined by my co-host and business partner, Kyle Sondland. Welcome back. And as a reminder to our podcast listeners through Apple Music and Spotify, the show is now on video as well. So it's posted on YouTube every Friday alongside our audio version. But before we move into this week's show, Kyle, it's time for us to share a word from our sponsor. This week's episode of the Security Talking Show is sponsored by First Shot Centers, LLC. They're based out of Las Vegas, Nevada, and they're offering 100 million first shot tokens at a price of $1 per token. That's a total of 100 million USD. The company is is raising money to finance the acquisitions and repurposing of empty and undervalued big box retail properties located in the United States. These properties have been hit hard due to the change in consumer tastes, and they will be repurposed to entertainment and themed centers that provide investors with equity and interest on the underlying properties. So the offering will be exclusively available to U.S. accredited investors only by utilizing the Regulation D-506C exemption. This will be followed by three more identical offerings in the future. To learn more about First Shot Centers and their STO, check out more information today at firstshotcenters.com. That's firstshotcenters.com. Thank you so much to First Shot for sponsoring the episode. This is Security Token Show, episode 99. And if you're new here, the way that we usually break down the episodes, we kick it off with our companies of the week. This is where Herwig and I pick a company that we love, we wanted to highlight, really pick them out and give them an, an accolade for doing that. From there, we move into the top five news segment. This is kind of a rapid fire segment where Herwig and I will go back and forth on the top five pieces of news you just couldn't miss over the week. From there, Herwig's going to take it away and break down everything institutional going on in the space, from banks to central bank digital currencies to everything else under the sun. Herwig's got it covered. From there, I move into our newest security token offering segment, talking about some of the deals, as well as the secondary market and how things are trading. And then finally, we're going to take it away with our main topic this week. Which one is that, Herwig? Well, we're going to be talking about NFTs and security tokens. Some of them might be security tokens. Some of them definitely aren't. We'll be getting all into that. But of course, first we got to start with our companies of the week. So, Kyle, who do you have for episode 99? So, my company of the week this week is a Canadian firm called Blockstream. And you may recognize the name Blockstream because we've covered them plenty of times on the show. They have launched a successful security token offering backed by Bitcoin mining operation that they have in, inside of their centers around the world. And they are actually selling a share of their Bitcoin mining revenue to their shareholders. They sold that out, 6.6 million euro deal. More on that later, but that's not even the main reason they won Company of the Week for me this week, despite the fact that it's a pretty successful piece of news. What else? They also launched the Blockstream AMP platform. And the Blockstream AMP platform is actually a platform looking to launch a bond, a debt offering that's tokenized in US dollars. And they launched this platform not just as an idea, but they're actually going to be working with the El Salvador government to collaborate with them in launching a US dollar denominated bond using this platform as well as their liquid side chain, which is their own proprietary blockchain that they'll be using for the settlement layer here. So they're going to be working with a very progressive government in El Salvador that's already been very, very you know, favorable in terms of looking at the Bitcoin, making it legal tender. Now they may be also looking into security tokens and US dollar denominated bonds. Shout out to Samson now, the whole team there, they're doing awesome work. Company of the week for sure. That's a huge win. That's almost a no-brainer, Kyle. Great choice. I think Blockstream is underappreciated both in the crypto and the security token space. As you pointed out, they've been doing a lot of big things and now working with El Salvador on their new bond tokenization platform. That's a huge, huge win. Congratulations to the Blockstream team. Yeah, absolutely. So that's exciting. How about you, Herwick? Well, it's my uh, pleasure to actually announce uh, a Wisconsin-based company called Hydra Chain Technology. So pretty fierce, cool-looking name. Believe it or not, they're a real estate developer that have partnered up with DigiShares. That's the Denmark-based issuance platform. They say they chose them because they found them as the best tokenization platform, specifically that could also support their blockchain of choice, 
which for Hydrochain is actually Ravencoin. So this is, I think, the second known STO issued on the Ravencoin, or at least some, one of the first, one of the first in real estate as well. And then, uh, and that's actually a six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars single-family home, and I believe it was called River Falls in Wisconsin. So this is obviously just the beginning. They're going to be offering much more opportunities to invest in U.S. real estate via tokens, specifically via Ravencoin tokens. And so that's an interesting alternative to some of the likes of Realty and some of the other players that we've seen offering access to also U.S. residential real estate. So for entering into the space with a strong partner and with a new blockchain. And also with a live STO, congratulations to Hydrochain Technologies. What do you think, Al? Great choice. I love to see how the tokenization of real estate is starting to grow. We've seen this as a use case for almost four or five years now as this ideal version of what secure tokens could be. And it's great to see so many different firms that are looking to take advantage of it in a bunch of different ways, whether it's Hydrochain, First Shot Centers, Realty, or Reno, many of the others here in the U.S. as well as internationally. There's a lot of great stuff going on there. Just getting started. And with that, let's get to the top five. Let's do it. And in this week's top five, we've got some pretty big announcements for you. We're starting off with number one, Circle, which has announced officially that they are spacking. Coming on the heels of the IPO from Coinbase just a few months ago, Circle is going to be following in their lead. Instead of IPOing though, they're going to be spacking, so they'll be acquired in a $4.5 billion deal. They've already raised, I think they raised 440 million just a month or two ago. They're now gonna be refinancing. I think they're getting another 450 million in working capital. And this is just huge. Circle, if you don't know or you're not familiar, they're a very popular fiat on-ramp from you know, traditional dollars into crypto. But they also have really built their brand around the USDC stablecoin. They've launched a stablecoin in partnership with Coinbase that now has $26 billion in circulating supply. And in their newest you know, documents they announced, and they're planning to have $190 billion in total supply by 2023. They really are flying, and this is a fantastic news. I think that's a, that's a great uh, announcement to hear from Circle. Makes yet another institutional play in the crypto space, this time through the Concord acquisition through this back. But Jeremy Allaire, the well-known CEO behind Circle, will remain as the CEO. And uh, as you pointed out, they're going to continue growing their, their USDC payment solution, right? It's already available through Ethereum, through Algorand, through Tron, and I expect on many, many more blockchains soon. And uh, we'll see if they can hit that almost $200 billion money supply mark, tokenized dollars, uh, by the end of uh, two years from now. And let's so. see if this triggers a wave. We've seen Kraken has been rumored to potentially be spacking and potentially others may join as well. Also important to note here, Circle, I believe, is a portfolio company of blockchain capital. So if you own some of those trading shares, you might be in for a little bit of payday. Another win there. So moving on to number two here, we've got Single Earth. So Single Earth has announced that they have raised almost $8 million in seed financing. Uh, specifically to help with their platform tokenizing carbon credits for landowners and farmland and forest landowners who instead of using and leveraging the raw materials on the land and destroying them, can instead leverage you know, carbon credits to go ahead and create a new revenue stream so that they don't have to go ahead and get, you know, deforest their land or raw the mine and the materials on the land. So that's a really great climate change. We have a big supporter of what's going on here. And EQT Ventures was the lead behind this race. So I expect to see a lot of carbon credit projects that will be leveraging their MERIT and ERIT tokens representing their carbon credits uh, for purchase for investors from all these projects. So very exciting, congratulations to them. Buy those credits beginning in fall 2021 to use to offset your own tax burdens. But moving into number three, we've got New Zealand. New Zealand is working on their own central bank digital currency. Sounds like a broken record at this point because almost every week we come into the top five with a new set of countries that are working on CBDCs and it shouldn't be a surprise. If you're a central bank, you should be exploring how to leverage digital currencies and digital transactional systems for what you're trying to do. And it just makes a lot of sense. There's right. there've been a lot of fun facts that come along uh, with this Yeah, too. the New Zealand uh, bank came out and I think rightfully like many countries during the corona pandemic saw a sharp decline in the usage of cash, a sharp increase of course in mobile payments and contactless payments. And they did some surveys. They actually found out that 
almost more than 40% actually uh, of the citizens didn't care about a CBDC and a digital payment solution. And of course, one of the other focuses was promoting financial inclusion. So mo like most central banks, I think around the world are looking at it. New Zealand has now joined the foray. And moving into number four, we've got news out of Cape Town, specifically Stellenbosch, where we see another property being tokenized and available for sale. This time for as little as $70, actually. It's a property worth roughly what I'm seeing here, $1.38 million. And it's actually eight different units as part of the award-winning Pearl Hotel, which actually includes its own golf course. Uh, and that's a pretty amazing feat. In fact, they're leveraging some very cool features. The company is called Real Smart. Uh, and for as little as a little less than $7,000 worth of tokens, you actually can get a free night there as well every year. So that's an exciting little perk for those of you who are willing to pay a little bit more than $70 for their RST tokens that represent an opportunity in this uh, investment. It's also exciting because they are going to be bringing deals globally. So they're eyeing the United States as well as Mauritius as two potential locations for additional future tokenizations. That's huge news. Welcome to the industry real smart and welcome Cape Town to your first tokenized investment opportunity. And moving into our final piece of news here, we've got more cross-border central bank digital payment exploration. And this comes from a group of countries, China, UAE, Hong Kong, Thailand, and a few others have all explored a test net of exchanging digital currencies for cross-border payments, citing specifically reduction of costs and improved efficiencies of interbank transfers. And so this is fascinating. They launched their test net and it apparently has gone very successfully and now they're exploring a wholesale retail solution. That's right. They've been uh, led, this project has been led by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the uh, stock exchange, uh, the National Stock Exchange of Thailand. Uh, and actually, this has been a multi-phase project that has been in the works already. In fact, phase two was successfully completed recently, where it actually allowed for the real-time 24-7 you know, transfer of payments cross-border. And now for phase three, they're looking to commercialize that and make that retail and you know, commercially available for the actual economy to leverage. No longer going from experimentation, but to as Kyle just pointed out, full-on testnet, which is a big, big step forward in progress. It's really exciting news. Again, just like we're talking about central bank digital currencies, they are here to stay and they are now here live in action. And that rounds out our top five news of the week. Herwig, take it away. Let's get into it. This week's latest news starts off with another announcement from the Bank de France regarding a successful central bank digital currency and securities trade settlement. Quickly making France's central bank the leading expert in CBDCs, this latest announcement involved another working group, this time from LiquidShare. The participants in the LiquidShare's consortium were AXA Investment Managers, BMP Pariba Security Services, CAC EIS Bank, CIC Market Solutions, Credit Agricole, Titres, Euroclear, Euronext, and seven other banks. And to top all that off, the Bank de France and the Monetary Authority of Singapore have also announced a successful CBDC trial, this time with JP Morgan's Onyx's division for help. And that's a huge cross-border accomplishment as well. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to read the French Central Bank's CBDC white paper presumably being published towards the end of this year. And next up, we have an announcement for a new product offering in the industry by Tata Consulting Services, or TCS. It's called Quartz for Markets, a tokenized security solution that targets exchanges, custodians, and other market infrastructures. The new offering isn't purely limited to stocks and can support fixed income and warrants. It can also cater to other digital asset classes targeted for tokenization, such as real estate, precious metals, art, and loyalty points, according to the press release. It aims to offer a full token issuance solution supporting Ethereum and R3's Corda blockchains. More competition enters the scene with this new offering, with the company being based out of India, by the way. And we've got an investment alert. Global stock exchange group GSX has today announced a strategic investment in CSX to launch a trading platform for tokenized assets and digitized securities in Asia. CSX, which is part of CoinStreet Partners Group, aims to support investors with their tokenization requirements ranging from stable coins, real estate, manufacturing, media and entertainment, and other sectors. It's always great to see and excitement around collaboration 
or security token exchanges. And GSX also owning the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. I expect this investment will bring a lot of strategic value to the CSX platform. And closing it up in Asia security token news, we have Hong Kong-based ZA International revealing that it has entered an agreement with BC Technology Group, which is the parent firm of OSL Digital Securities, a Securities and Futures Commission, that's the SFC, licensed digital asset service provider in Hong Kong. Through the partnership, OSL should become the exclusive digital asset trading partner to ZA International, which in turn will allow ZA to offer services related to digital assets to clients and OSL to leverage ZA's innovative and technologies in key areas like facial recognition and machine learning in order to improve the user experience of its trading platform. Seems like a strong partnership between the two firms. And moving into resources and opinions from last week, we start off with an investment firm, Arca, who released its latest white paper titled Digital Assets, ESG, Why Not GSE? The report is a deep dive into digital asset investing and ESG principles targeting professional investors in the crypto space. Definitely anyone who is conscious about this important topic should give this a read. And next, we have a back-to-back -back amazing articles from Bloomberg's Michael Reagan and Matt Levine. Michael Reagan's article talks about the latest craze on Mirror Protocol and others, where you can actually trade fake versions of Tesla stock by placing synthetic bets on these blockchain protocols. If that sparked your curiosity, then definitely go read this article because it explains it intricately. And so does Matt Levine's breakdown of the model using a tokenized trust vehicle or using cash settled swaps on the blockchain. I would describe this article as eloquent and almost beautifully broken down of this technology and a potential for the future of capital markets as a whole. You know, actually Matt's Money Stuff column on Bloomberg is really, really fantastic. And we also have a great article of a breakdown on blockchain disrupting capital markets on Forecast News by Lucas Schwager of Block Data. It's actually a two-parter, and this first article discusses the truly remarkably large market potential of this industry and breaks it down by subsector, including key players and nice infographics. Definitely a nice overview for anyone new to the industry. We'll be sure to look out for part two. And finally, we got Peter Gaffney's 23rd edition of Tokenize This focused on tokenized DeFi yield funds out on the STO Market blog. Peter breaks down how tokenized fund vehicles that invest in DeFi yield farming could offer investors passive exposure to this asset class, which I think is yet again a phenomenal use case that no one has done. It's waiting for someone to do, and Peter breaks down the whole play, so go check that out for a full resource list of all these articles. Just go check out the description of wherever you're listening to or watching on YouTube. And that's all the news you need to know from last week. Let's head over to Kyle and get the latest STO announcements and trading updates. In our STO updates and new STO segments this week, we're kicking it off with a small update from the Blockstream Mining Note, the security token offering backed by Bitcoin mining power on the Stalker platform. In a tweet this week, Chief Strategy Officer Samson Mao confirmed that Bitcoin mining for the token has officially begun. Each BMN token is doing 2,000 terahash, which is due to the recent hash rate drop, which is generating about five Bitcoin a year at the current difficulty. This note runs for a three-year term, and the company raised 6.6 .6 million euros with a token price of 200,000 per token. So we can use that to calculate the estimated return for the token in the Bitcoin mining rewards. According to my calculation, at a current Bitcoin price of 35,000, five Bitcoins, investors shouldn't expect a 73% yearly return on the BMN token. Over three years, investors will nearly get 2.25x in Bitcoin without factoring in the changes to the mining difficulty or the price of Bitcoin over that period. This is awesome transparency from the team and great news for token holders as it seems to be poised to pay out really strong returns. And our first offering this week comes from the Efinity token, who has most recently announced the sale of their QREDO token, which aims to bring liquidity and capital efficiency to the blockchain economy while maintaining a decentralized custody on a next generation consensus driven network, enabling programmable governance, encrypted messaging and security measures for institutional trading of DeFi and smart contracts. That's a mouthful. The platform aims to offer a modern, mainstream, and developer-friendly NFT experience so that creators don't have to work with the high fees 
the inflexible smart contracts, and the disjointed interoperability that the traditional market provides. Two public options for the Credo token sales were offered with the registration for both options closing on July 6th, following the token sales to begin on July 8th at separate times for each option. It's exciting to see the demand for the token with over 652,000 unique registrants, making it the second highest in coin list history as a digital asset platform. Great to see a lot of hype around this. The final offering I have this week is from Link Capital Group, who has announced their plans to raise up to $10 million with assets backed by tranches of 50,000 agarwood trees. So that's two tranches, 100,000 trees in total in Laos, a country in Asia that neighbors Vietnam. The funds raised will go towards the expansion of the existing processing facilities for the 100,000 trees on location. The entire crop of 100,000 agarwood trees will be insured by international rated insurance providers from Europe to mitigate the risks against loss from natural disasters, theft, damage, and others. These trees are used for medicine as well as consumer products, and it certainly makes sense since lumber and other commodities have skyrocketed in price across the last 18 months or so worldwide. The tokenized offering will be known as the Liquid Gold Offering with a ticker of LQGO and is expected to be listed at the end of July 2021 on the CESA licensed Crypto SX Exchange, which is quickly becoming a great option for liquidity for Filipino and South Asian security token offerings. It's a cool use case and one I look forward to following moving forward. Moving into the market update segment for this week, for episode 99, we begin with a few pieces of news from the secondary market, with our first coming from the crypto exchange PayBito, who has announced that they are ready to host stock tokens on their platform. We've called them tokenized stocks. You can call them whatever you want. We've seen other crypto exchanges like Binance and FTX enter into this space, and now another is exploring the opportunity. They specifically mentioned that they have a focus on compliance which is great to hear, but it seems like the reality of these assets is that they're just not really able to use any regulation to their benefit. So we're going to have to see how the strategy differs from what has been used by Binance, which has found themselves in some very hot water, to put it lightly. However, they are noting that they're going into the space due to the increasing demand, which is a good sign for the industry. The other piece of news I have for this week is the security token market June 2021 report, which details the trading market history over the last month. And according to the report put together by security token market analyst Sam Sachs, the market cap grew about 5% this month, while the trading volume was actually up over 30%. We saw a strong rise from T0, which led all security tokens and monthly gains in June. With It was up 17%, followed by some realty tokens, which also saw appreciation. Rilio, Mount Pelerin, and Curzio led the downtrend, each seeing like 20% drops in price. So that's going to be interesting to watch. You can check out more information like which tokens saw the most volume this month or which exchange saw the largest growth by clicking the link in the security token market report for June 2021. You can find that in the description below. And turning our attention to the tra trading market over the past week, now is a good time to remind you that all trading prices and news that we cover across the whole podcast and show today comes from stomarket.com. But looking into the trading market, first off, Mount Pelerin bounced back from a tough month in June, up nearly 10% this week to $4.31. Remember, that's on Uniswap, so you do see a lot of price changes there. From there, most of the lead this week was from Realty Properties, where 45 properties finished in the green this week with an average gain of around 2 to 3%. Again, they get 10 to 12 in dividends a year. T0 fell a few percent down to $6.50, but it's still seeing really strong volume, which is a good sign for the ATS. A lot of the market actually did trade down this week, including many of the tokenized stock derivatives from Binance and FTX, just because of the public markets were the same way. But there were some strong gains from Coinbase, Amazon, and Apple. But the highlight here again is that these derivative shares just see incredible volume on the trading market. 27 of the top 30 trading tokens were stocks this week, led again, of course, by Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, with nearly double the third trading token's volume and 50% more than second place, logging over 3.3 million US dollars in trading volume in just this week alone. Tesla, ARK, NEO, and Alibaba followed to round out the top five, all netting more than a million dollars in weekly volume. 
These tokenized stocks just continue to dominate and we'll have some great insights to uncover following the release of our tokenized stock market report that's going to be coming soon. And with that, it's time to transition back to the studio to cover our main topic this week, which is going to be NFTs and security tokens. You're in for a good one. And moving into the main topic for episode 99 of the Security Token Show, we're going to be diving into the fact that some NFTs might be security tokens. You may be familiar with the term NFTs or this whole explosion of digital art where we have non-fungible tokens. These are representations of art and some of these things that have sold for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of dollars in some cases. And this scene has blown up in the space. But what we've also seen a little bit of is sometimes some of these issuers are trying to attach assets or some of these other rights to the underlying artwork, which could be a big no-no unless they're following all of the regulations and restrictions around securities offerings. So today we're going to dive into and really let set the record straight on what this stuff is, how it works, and how these two pieces can play together. Let's do it, Kyle. But of course, before we do that, I think we need to make sure that our audience is all on the same page, right? What is an NFT, a non-fungible token? By definition, it means that there's only one in the world. There's only one token that can be traced on chain for that specific use case. And in this case, the use case we're mostly talking about is simply tracking ownership of a specific piece of art or media or anything else really. We are seeing a lot of different use cases. We're gonna talk about it. But most importantly, the distinction we're trying to get at is when we're talking about security tokens or even other cryptocurrencies, they are fungible. You can have hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of them and they all mean the same thing. A hundred Apple shares means a hundred Apple shares to Kyle. There isn't one unique Apple share that we're all trading. And that's where we get into the use cases. We saw the rise of digital collectibles. The fact that I hold a trading card that's digital, that shows that I own it. The only way to show that is on chain, showing that I hold the token. Same thing goes for art. When we have art online that we're going to show that who can track it, we can all see it around the world. We can all view it. But who actually owns it? Well, according to the blockchain and according to the NFT, that's who owns it. And that's the use case for NFTs that has now led to sales, as you mentioned, Kyle, $69 million for a specific digital piece of art. Uh, we've seen actual artists go ahead and, and create new capabilities for fan engagement, like getting access to early music or being able to actually own art by the artists themselves. We saw the Kings of Leon do this, The Weeknd, Dead Mouse is doing this, many, many other artists are doing this. And we've even seen the likes of the New York Stock Exchange memorialize IPOs that are happening through their own NFT. Lots of really cool use cases that are happening in the world, right? Yeah, it's it's, it's pretty interesting. Some of these you know, hallmark deals, the NFT for an IPO listing of Coinbase, for example, is pretty fascinating. That's a, it's a cool representation of a historic moment. You've got some of these fan engagement pieces that are also very cool. You mentioned Kings of Leon. They not only did the NFT where you can own some digital art issued by the band, but it also could represent front row tickets for any concert for life if you owned one of these golden ticket NFTs that That's they valuable. launched. So there's some cool fan engagement pieces here that certainly have some value and are really fun, I think, for, for the communities that are participating in it. One of the things that we've actually seen, as you pointed out earlier, the way the benefits to make these more feature rich and you know add value to the tokens overall is by adding things like royalties or resale rights so that if you were to sell the token perhaps the original issuer gets some some money back from the sale or even if you own it you're entitled to someone else using the art in media or commercial purposes and therefore you are actually entitled to some of those royalty payments because it is your media that you are now sharing and licensing out to others here is where we get Tricky. This is actually what we might say crossing the line, if you will. Mm -hmm. We all need to get familiar, especially those in the NFT space, with the Howey test. For those of us in the industry, we're all very familiar with it. It's the SEC's way of determining what is a security. The Howey test was a court case way back when regarding citrus groves. And basically, they set up a couple of prongs that we need to watch out for. And one of those major prongs is the fact that you have an expectation of profit. So if I'm buying a token that has a royalty or it's been sold to me or advertised to me as something that might appreciate in value, like a trading collectible card, we might be crossing one of those prongs. Another prong is the fact that we're relying on the third party efforts of others. In this case, 
We might be relying on an artist or a marketplace or even the blockchain technology that could be considered as a tool to, to manage, you know, uh, creating an entity for profit, making business, right? So that's what would be an investment contract. Mm -hmm. And that's what the SEC is looking out for. And that's why we get worried about NFTs that have rights and royalties and other things that might just be interpreted as a security. Yeah, the art world and collectible world as a whole have always pushed back against this notion that no, you're not buying into an investment, you're buying into a you know physical asset or a collectible that has intrinsic value and it's in low supply. So there may be increasing demand over time as other people also see value in it. That's kind of always been the argument there and how they've tried to stay off of the radar of regulators. I think what you're pointing out here is that taking it the step further by entitling those owners to rights to future revenue of what that art could earn or any of these different pieces in terms of we've seen some other examples of you know, the Club Nicaxa, a, a Mexican soccer team that's attaching ownership in the actual comp, you know, team to the NFT, or we've seen other examples of real estate properties that attach the deed of the, the actual house to the NFT. These start to bring up examples where you're talking about a real investment contract. You're not only just buying this NFT because you like the collectible, you likely are also buying it because of these investment mechanisms that come on top Absolutely. of it. And I think those are two good examples we can dive into because one did it the right way and one not so much. That's right. One recognized that they are absolutely offering an investment contract. Owning a team is an investment. The team can be resold. The team earns revenue from media and from winning uh, leagues and things mm -hmm. like that. So that's absolutely a business. And so Nicoxa, they did it the right way. Even though both used the same platform, what Nicoxa did was they said, you know what? We need to know who's potentially buying our security token, our NFT. In this way, they actually had investors register. They had to go through KYC, AML. For those in the U.S., they had to go through accreditation requirements, a requirement for you to be able to invest in this specific case. So they were whitelisting their investors, making sure that everyone qualified. I'm sure they probably had similar legal documents associated on that website that you could review regarding the investment opportunity. And then at the end of the day, the NFT, simply a token, I think it was on the Ethereum blockchain issued on OpenSea, would represent that ownership. It was the proof that you as the investor were the owner and anyone in the world could see that on the blockchain, which is pretty cool on top of the fact that it had a nice little digital image associated with it too. Uh, on the other hand, we saw a real estate deed, as you were pointing out, did it the wrong way. In this case, they simply said, you know what, we're, we're putting a deed up. Anyone can go ahead and go to OpenSea and buy our token and they'll be entitled to 50% of the, the rental uh, income that's produced by the property. Of course, there is no whitelisting going on. Anyone can buy this token, which means someone perhaps doing illicit money laundering or something like that could come in and now start trying to wash their money through this. And of course, the issuer themselves is probably violating a number of different securities laws. The thing that you need to know as an NFT potential investor, when that NFT triggers the securities line and crosses that mark, you may be entitled to all of your money back in the event of fraud or any issues or anything like that. So this is something that issuers and investors need to be aware of. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we've made that very clear on this show today. Yeah, definitely be careful and be smart about how you're investing in these things. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We talk about, you know, tokenized and fractionalized real estate all the time on this show. There's a reason why all of these issuers and all these players are taking the proper steps to make sure their investors are protected. That's something that you should expect, appreciate, and demand from any investment that you're making, and you need to make sure that you uphold that. Absolutely, you need to. So at the end of the day, some NFTs might be security tokens. Most are not, and most security tokens themselves are definitely not NFTs. So a very unique one-share kind of use case that we're seeing. So hopefully, again, if you have any questions, you learned something here, feel free to reach out to Kyle or myself. We're available on LinkedIn or on Twitter, or you can reach out and you know, go to the stomarket.com website where you get the latest trading information, the latest news, as well as research and reports and information on our blog. And if you want to get that all in a nice weekly digest, you can sign up for our What's Dripping newsletter and join us on Thursdays on Clubhouse, where we'll be speaking with other guest panelists from the industry, CEOs, lawyers, token issuers about the show every week on Thursday at 5 p.m. Check it out. We've got all the media. We've got all the news, all the content. You can find it everywhere, stomarket.com. Thanks you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week on Friday. Happy tokenizing.